the Nittany Lions travel to Bloomington for a business trip. Most of the meetings take place in the Hoosiers' backfield. A record amount of tackles for losses as the D-line finds its groove. It's a good group. We just compete with each other, make each other better. The receivers continue to get better as they haul in some tough catches in difficult conditions. And it's Military Appreciation Week. The red, white, and blue will be prominent as the blue and white try to take down the Terps. This is Nittany Game Week. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Nittany Game Week. I'm Todd Sadowski, along with our coaches, Jay Paterno and Tom Bradley. It's always fun to win, of course, but when you travel to Bloomington, pretty much a business trip, and the Nittany Lions handle their business against the Hoosiers to improve to 7-2. and two. They did all they could do, and they got up early, and they got a lot of guys in the game, and I think came back with a lot of pluses. They went in to get a job done. They got it done and got out of there. That's a tough place to play sometimes, and people don't realize that. Yeah, mission accomplished. You had said many times, got to create your own energy when you head to Bloomington in that environment. So PSU controls the line of scrimmage in extreme weather conditions. Two arms are just as effective as one for the afternoon, and you can describe this receiving unit as shorthanded on a tough day in our opening drive. <laughs> Well, here we go, and this guy looks comfortable hanging out at Indiana. That's former Hoosier and new athletic director Dr. Pat Kraft back in Bloomington. Pick a side, guys, offense or defense, and the Nittany Lions assume control of the line of scrimmage. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of tackles for losses, but offensively did a nice job protecting the quarterbacks when they had to and giving the running backs some room to run. See, I thought the defense set the tone right off the get-go. Early in the game, six tackles for losses. You could just tell where it was going from there. 16 total, Tom, and the defensive line, boy, they just were especially in the backfield for the Hoosiers yep. all day long. Yep. It started off that way early. You could see the push they were getting up front, and you knew it was going to be a long day for Indiana at that point. Yeah, and the pass rush in the Indiana ended up having to play three different quarterbacks, which is never a good sign. Yeah, not only did they physically dominate, the defensive lineman picked up several keys before Indiana even snaps the ball. The DNs, the offensive tackles, they was looking at us when they were blocking us, so that was a big key for them. And they was going tempo, so you know they wasn't really going on two. They were snapping the ball on the first clap, so that was two keys that we was getting from the DN's uh, perspective. And the pressure leads to tip balls and interceptions, not just tackles for loss. And one of those days to remember for both the offensive and defensive linemen. Yeah, quite a lot of young guys got in the game, got in the act this, this week, and I think that's good. You know, when you get into this stretch of the game, um, when you've had some tough games and some of the younger guys haven't played, to get them back in, including Drew Aller, obviously getting him in. A lot of people want to see him. I think it was a productive day all around. That's one of the important things, having the opportunity to play them, that you had the chance to get them in because you're going to need them and then as this season keeps rolling along. Well, you got to get in front of the game. They didn't change anything as far as the way they approached it. Sean Clifford was going to be the starter all along, and if they could get Drew Aller some snaps, Jay, they were going to do so. And once they got in front enough in the third yeah. quarter, he was able to get some meaningful snaps. Yeah, I think it's, it's good to get a quarterback in, but it's also better when he's really playing with house money. When you're up 31-7, you come in, you have the ability to kind of just let it hang out, let it play, get used to the speed of the game. So that if you do have to come in uh, in the future when the game's on the line, you've already kind of got that behind you. All right, Coach said he wants to see Clifford clean up the interceptions, but was complimentary of both QBs. Overall, he does what he always does, which is to do a great job of man managing the protections, great job of all the checks that we're using in the run game or the fine motions and things like that that we do uh, to account for guys. And then Drew got in and got a couple series uh, with the ones against the one defense. And then late in the game, it was a bunch of the twos in there against the two defense. So it's kind of hard. You're not really comparing apples to apples. They're probably the best case scenario to secure the win and then get Aller into the game when you get him some good, good, meaningful snaps. Another positive sign. No matter which quarterback is throwing the ball, the receivers, and this includes the tight ends, they're really growing into reliable targets. Saw some good catches on a difficult, windy day. It wasn't easy out there to throw it around. No doubt, and some really big catches in some really big situations. Third and long where you don't make that catch, you're punting into the wind. Um, they came up with some really big clutch catches, which really made the quarterbacks look good, too. 
plus there's some yak yards in there two yeah. yards after the catch was great too. Yeah, and defensively, Tom, when you've got a play covered and a guy makes a catch like Mitchell Tinsley does around or Brenton Strange brings hey, don't it down, you hate kind that. of frustrating. Don't you just hate that when that happens. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know D coordinators love they that hate stuff. That. Yeah. They hate those great catches. Make the play already, okay? <laughs> they didn't make, you know, somebody got to make a play. All right, let's get to the scrap metal. All right, Katron Allen is this week's winner, Tom, and you like the way he goes north-south. You like just about everything he's doing these days. Well, you know, he grew up in Northford, Virginia, went to IMG Academy, had a heck of a day, 18 carries for 86 yards, two receptions for 72, and three touchdowns. How can he not win the scrap medal this week? Well, Jay, you called it early in the year. You really like the way that this, this guy has his running style. He's used in the, play, in the passing game as well and got a lot of yards, but you really like to see his progress and vision. No question. I think, I think from, I've said from day one, I think he's ahead of Singleton in terms of reading the blocking schemes with the vision stuff, uh, and that's continued to prove out with the way he's been able to do some things. And the one catch for the, the long catch was really just a little flip that is essentially a running play. Yeah. Um, and really made the most of that as well. So he's been great. Turned it into a big game. Now the freshman class and especially the combination of Allen and Singleton is gaining national attention. This freshman class at Penn State is one of the better freshman classes in the entire country. And they've been huge contributors for this Nittany Lion team. First, the running backs, Catron Allen and Nick Singleton. They've transformed the run game. And, and a lot of credit goes to the offensive line as well. But those two guys have been dynamic carrying the, uh, carrying the ball. The high praise from Joel Klatt. Singleton's a previous winner of the scrap medal, and it's certainly fun to watch them both. Still to come, our scouting report. Not sure we'd go so far to say fear the turtle, but you definitely need to respect their offensive abilities. Our coaches break down both sides of the Terps. Nittany Game Week returns after this. Scrap Metal is sponsored by the We Are In. Voted number one game day restaurant in Center County. Follow us on Facebook and visit thewearein.com or call for dinner or room reservations. We are back on Nittany Game Week. Don't let the point spread fool you. The Nittany Lions are almost two touchdown favorites and have dominated this head-to-head -head series. The Terps stuck close with Michigan for a while and are fully capable of lighting up a scoreboard. Just the kind of intriguing opponent Coach Paterno and Coach Bradley love to examine. And guys, what do you see that says fear the turtle? And in what areas do you think they can turn them into turtle soup? Well, I don't ever fear a turtle because that's the one animal I can outrun. <laughs> but there's some good things to think about this weekend. And this is a tougher challenge than people think. It's, it's going to be a difficult game. But let's talk about the running backs. Penn State has freshman running backs. Maryland has freshman running backs. Redshirt freshman running backs. Kind of a thunder and lightning with... Hemby being the fast guy, Littleton being the 235-pound the <laughs> bruiser. Now, since they've joined the Big Ten, uh, Maryland has given Penn State some problems. Prior to the Big Ten, 0-21 at Penn State, 2-2 two two since joining the Big Ten. And if you look at all the guys, know each other, because there's so many guys from the same area, this turns into a very, very physical game and a one that becomes very personal. So let's talk about the X's and O's of it. Uh, no, when you're watching the game, is 31 in the game, is 24 in the game. He's the speed guy. He's the guy that's the receiver. 31 is the bruiser. Take a look at, at uh, Hemby getting out in the open on this one. Gets into that hole. You see they do a nice job getting that hole, Tom, and then... You can see his speed right there. And he's got great vision, too, when you watch him. Yeah, he makes the right cut, and off he goes. Now, let's talk about what they do off that run game. Now they come at you with Tom's favorite... The it's dreaded, not my favorite. The dreaded three-level yeah. play-action pass. I, I'm not they, a fan yes. of this, this three-level flood. Good hard yeah. fake front side, deep clear, one to two to three. You had Take. to ruin my day, didn't you? Yes. God. And this is different because they bring the backside guy, Tom. Yes, they do, which makes it even harder. Yeah, and he does a nice job keeping his eyes downfield and find that guy. Now, you can come off that. They've got a little triple option type thing going where now they're going to bring the wide out across to get all these guys running that way. They're going to bring the tight end who's really more of a receiver. And now the tailback's out here. They read this guy, Tom, and now you know that gives you fits. 
what does give you fits of thing that you got to remember that motion's a little tricky at times because that's just trying to create some bad eyes. That's just a distraction going across and can create some problems because when you're doing your coverage, who's got who now too? Yeah, if you go to the next one, but that creates a lot of traffic for you. Go to the next one now. We'll talk about uh, what they do on uh, with well, he does a great job when he scrambles, keeping his eyes downfield. You, defenders cannot come out of coverage too fast. No, they can't. I think it's a great illustration when you watch this play of how good he is with his eyes. And then really does a nice job resetting his feet, which is the trickiest part. Finds the guys downfield. They follow the scramble rules and onto that. And so let's talk now about them defensively. They are a 3-4 type defense. Two big outside linebackers, Tom. And they get this guy involved. He's half run, half pass defender. So they can get a lot of guys around the ball. And they can. And these two outside edge guys are keys because they can play defensive end. They can drop. They can do a lot of things. They're big people. Yeah, and they're very experienced. A lot of these guys have played against each other the last two years when Penn State and Maryland have split the last two games in the series. A lot of guys have played both. Now, let's talk about third down has been a problem for them. One of the things that they did last week, or against Michigan State, they went to a little bit of spy, which I think with Sean Clifford's running ability, I think you'll see them go to some man, man coverage, safeties high, but have a guy watching yeah, Sean. I, I like the man under too deep, except for one thing, when that quarterback can run. Yeah. Now they force you into the three-man rush because the spy. Yeah. But what I always say, can the spy tackle the quarterback? Yeah, and, and, and this guy does a nice job chasing him down and forcing him to throw it away. And last thing we talk about, uh, one of their corners, Bennett, number two, uh, since the beginning of two, 2021 has led the country in pass breakups, also blocks kicks. They do a nice job getting over the top here and bringing him off the edge. And this wing is stuck with the two-for-one there. This wing, though, better understand – that's a bad technique right there. You step yeah. down and punch out. But you got to get your hand on him. Does you a sure nice do. job coming off that edge of blocking the kick. And let's hope Penn State's kicking a lot of PATs on Saturday and that none of them get blocked in. Todd, nothing ever blocks you from greatness. No, thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> and Jake Penninger has actually been pretty good. So the kicking game kind of straightened itself out with Penn State if they need it against the Terps. All right, definitely a dangerous offensive team coming to Happy Valley. It's almost the time of the show when we catch up with our impact interview guest. Viewers still buzzing about our interview from last episode with Steelers head coach Mike Tomlin. If you missed this bit of info, one of Coach Tomlin's favorite players growing up in the Tidewater area of Virginia is a former Nittany Lions running back. We're not trying to be some mystical guy that's, that's not familiar to us or in our communities. We're, we're trying to be like the guy that's just a few years older than us. In my case, it was guys like DJ Dozier um, who really made us want to be, want to be Nittany Lions and want to be running backs. Yeah, we spent an awesome 15 minutes with Coach Tomlin talking about college football and the people that influenced him in his football career. Make sure you check out the entire interview at NittanyGameWeek.com. And you know what? Coach got us thinking. We should call up DJ Dozier as our next impact interview, and that's exactly what we did. We'll ask the former Nittany Lion about Coach Tomlin's comments and discuss his past as a two-sport star when we come back on Nittany Game Week. Impact Interview is sponsored by the Pocono Mountains, where small-town charm meets big adventures. Book your trip today by visiting PoconoMountains.com. Well, welcome back. Time for our impact interview. Certainly knows what it's like to burst onto the scene as a true freshman. Led the team in rushing with over 1,000 yards in 1983. Was an All-American by the time his career ended and scored the game-winning touchdown to clinch the 86 National Championship. And talk about versatile. First-round pick in the NFL in 87. Played five years with the Vikings and played in the major leagues with the Mets for a brief time simultaneously. What an honor. Please welcome DJ Dozier to Nittany Game Week. Nice to have you, DJ. Hey, nice to be here, Todd. Good to see both you and, or you, Jay and Tom. Well, look, we call this thing our impact interview, and you certainly made the decision to come to Penn State from Virginia. So tell us about that choice and how coming to PSU has impacted your life all these years later. Well, there's no doubt I made the right choice. Uh, I mean, Penn State, the experience was incredible. Uh, back then, you know, I had five visits five different schools. Uh, Penn State ended up actually being the, the last school that I chose to to visit uh, just simply because I didn't I didn't know if Penn State was still interested uh, like some of the other schools. And so my last visit was or my choice of my last visit was between 
Nebraska, Alabama, UCLA, and of course Penn State. And and I, when I got to Penn State on my recruiting trip, uh, I right away realized how you know dedicated the university and Coach Joe was with making sure you had a at least a, a nice experience coming up as a as a recruit. When I walked away and I got back home, I immediately said to my mom, I know exactly where I need to go. This year, two freshman running backs have taken the lead for Penn State's offense. In your freshman year, uh, as Todd mentioned, you kind of jumped, burst on the scene, but you, you went into a 12-game season that included games against seven ranked opponents with two wins over top five teams. So how hard was that transition for you going from high school to college and the demands of that kind of schedule? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, what, what was amazing uh, at, at Penn State, and at least my experience, and I tried to pass on the same kind of uh, thing um, as, as I got older at Penn State, but John Williams took me under his wing and really taught me about things that I wouldn't have learned, uh, Not even, maybe not even from the coaching staff. Um, you know, he was teaching me things from experience on the field. And so by the third game, uh, of, of my freshman year. I mean, although, you know, limited experience, I had enough instruction from from the head guy, you know, uh, to at least get out there and have an impact. And uh, so, I, you know, I, I remember one of the first games I got the starter. Uh, uh, it was against Alabama, the big game. And um, I remember looking across the, the huddle and seeing big old John Hand. I think he was about six seven. Uh, I don't know how much he weighed, 275, 280, whatever it was. And in my mind, I'm thinking, dude, you better run hard and fast. Don't worry. I mean, so, you know, you got as a running back, the best running backs, I used to say at least, is that you, you know, you run scared and, and you run hard. Hey, DJ, it's good to see you, my friend. It's been a while. Hey, Penn State good plays Maryland this weekend. And from your time at Penn State, you went 3-0 and against the Terps. Penn State opened the 1985 season as an underdog at 7th-ranked Maryland and got a 20-18 win. How big was that win in sparking a 23-1 record over your last two seasons at Penn State? No, you know, Tom, I remember that game. That was, matter of fact, it, you know, of course, back, and I, I'm, I'm not sure if they still have grass, but it was on the grass, but it was still over 100 degrees that game. So not just a tough opponent, but, uh, you know, had to deal with the elements. And I remember having to sit. Uh, at least for a series, just to grasp my breath uh, in that game. Many guys lost, uh, you know, 10, 12, 15 pounds. So not just a big game, but, uh, you know, dealing with the elements was, was rough. So, DJ, here's a question we've waited a whole week to ask you. Last week, our Impact interview was with Pittsburgh Steelers head coach Mike Tomlin, and we asked him about growing up and playing in the talent-rich area of the Virginia Tidewater region. He stated he grew up pretending he was DJ Dozier when he was a kid playing football in the backyard. What was your experience like playing there, and how cool is that, knowing that one that you inspired one of the most successful NFL coaches of this era? Well, you know, obviously that's a tremendous honor, right? It's... Uh... Uh, but that that's also just the way it is in this area. Uh, I mean, we had some growing up, I looked, you know, I mean, most people don't realize that Lawrence Taylor played, you know, down the highway a bit um, at Lafayette. But uh, one of the one of the running backs that I enjoyed watching as a kid uh, was out of Lake Taylor High School, uh, famous Amos, uh, uh, Amos Lawrence. And, uh, you know, I think you guys will remember that name. Yep. None of the young guys would, right? <laughs> uh, you know, that, it's, a, it's an honor for Coach Tomlin to say what he said. Uh, uh, tremendous, but uh, you know, it's just, it's just a, you know, a great star beside uh, this area. What a treat to catch up with two sports star DJ Dozier. Not many guys can say they have NFL and MLB experience. We're going to step aside for the TV show to take a break. We will continue our interview with DJ. Make sure you go to NittanyGameWeek.com for the entire interview, along with other web-exclusive content. Big week for the country, Veterans Day, midterm elections. It's a patriotic week in Happy Valley as well. We'll talk about Military Appreciation Week when we come back, along with the players, to watch for the 3.30 kickoff with Maryland. We're heading into the final minutes on Nittany Game Week. 
Well, for the 11th consecutive year, Penn State hosts Military Appreciation Week. It leads up to the Maryland game, and we've seen some Nittany Lions that are part of military families lead the team onto the field with the flag. Of course, we want to say thank you to our veterans and active military members for their service and protecting, protecting us all around the world as you see a flyover as well. A veterans luncheon, World War II exhibit, open house at the All Sports Museum, some cool events all week long to honor veterans and even active military members on staff at Penn State. Nice touch all week long. And well deserved. They're the greatest men that ever lived. Yeah, yep, I tell you, the, the men and women that protect us, we really appreciate it. All the things that they've been given this week, you know, it was a big week for the country, elections, all that kind of stuff, so really playing into that. All right, leading up to the Terps, which means we have some players to watch on both sides of the ball for yeah, Maryland. Yeah, Bennett, number two, the corner we talked about, uh, leads the country in, in pass breakups since 2021 and this season, but also up front, uh, very veteran group. Uh, Greg China rose at two sacks versus Penn State last year. Yeah, it's one of the things they did. This is a veteran group more so than people think. They've played a lot of football, this group. And you look at the O-line, 122 com combined starts, which is an average of 24 starts per guy. The left tackle has started 34 games, and then their wide receivers have been around, too, with 68 combined starts. Jarrett has had some big games against Penn State the last two years. Well, it's interesting. They got veterans at, at both corners and wide out to see how it pairs up with the Nittany Lions. So we see how they can match up on the day with Sean Clifford throwing a veteran there, and we'll see if we see Drew Aller. So there's your players to watch for both the offense and defense for the Maryland term. Sorry, right, we're into the second half of our season on the show. Show 12, 12 of 20 will take you all the way through the bowl game. Don't miss our depth chart at NittanyGameWeek.com, which includes these local businesses. In addition to the program, we're building a team in the community that supports the show and that you in turn support as a viewer to keep the PSU businesses strong. If you haven't noticed yet, we got a lot to share with you when it comes to college football, and we're having a lot of fun creating some bonus material. Make sure to check it out at NittanyGameWeek.com for our web-exclusive content. Seven and two, trying to go eight and two and climb another notch or two in the college football playoff rankings. Currently 14th, heading into the matchup with the Terps. We finished with some pride picks. Two more home games to go, so show us your spirit. For Jay and Tom, I'm Todd. Thanks so much for watching Nittany Game Week. We'll see you next time.